from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to turn you to turn with me to a very familiar passage of Scripture to all of you. And uh, that is uh, found in Romans, the first chapter, and the 17th verse. And then I want us to turn over to Galatians, the sixth chapter, where in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is explaining what he meant in the 17th verse of the first chapter. And this was the verse that shook all of Europe a little over 500 years ago when it was discovered and it was revealed to him in a powerful way to Martin Luther. First chapter of Romans, the 17th verse. And therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Not by our own goodness, not by our own works, but by faith. By grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then we turn over to Galatians, the sixth chapter. What a marvelous chapter this fifth chapter is, and the sixth chapter. And the sixth chapter has something I want to speak on, and I've never before preached a sermon on this text. Be, beginning with verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I want to speak tonight on sowing and reaping. I noticed as we came in the lush farmland that's here in this Red River Valley. I guess there's nothing quite like it in the United States. I used to come to Fargo quite often, stop here at Fargo, Moorhead. You couldn't get to Winnipeg without stopping on Northwest Airlines here on a DC-3. Back in the 40s, we used to go back and forth to Winnipeg a lot, and we stopped here a lot. And I would see this country and often marvel at its lushness and congratulate you and your grandparents and parents that came here and settled here because this has become one of the great areas of the entire United States. I was born and reared on a farm, and I've read about families that have been losing their family farms, and I was reared on a family farm. And I remember the days back in the 20s and the 30s, back during the Depression when my father would look for rain and we would pray for rain, and we raised wheat and barley and grain. We didn't have sugar beets, but we did raise other things that would be familiar to you. Then my father had a, what he called a truck farm where he raised vegetables. And then we had dairy cattle and we milked. And every morning from the time I was about seven or eight, I had to get up at three o'clock and go milk cows. And when I was in high school, I milked 20 cows every morning before I went to school and milked those same 20 when I came home from school. And so I knew a little bit about farm work. Now, I believe that they're in the Bible there are five laws in sowing and reaping. First, you must sow to reap. In China, 2,000 years old seed were taken from an ancient tomb, and they're sprouting today and growing tomatoes, even though they were sown 2,000 years ago. But it wasn't until they were sown that they could produce a crop for reaping. We have to sow to reap. Now in Hosea, it says, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Think of it, sow in goodness, sow in righteousness, reap in mercy. If you sow in righteousness, living a good life, putting your faith and your confidence in Christ, you are going to reap the mercy of God and the grace of God and salvation. For it is time, the scripture says, to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Has righteousness reigned upon you? Because unless you are clothed in the cloth of the righteousness of God, you'll never enter heaven. And that suit of clothes or that dress of righteousness was provided by the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. We have a cross on our, all of our churches, whatever our denomination may be. We agree on one thing, that the cross is the central fact of Christianity. 
And it's on the cross that Christ hung for our sins and died for us and provided for us a righteousness that you cannot provide for yourself. In Psalm 126, 5, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross in tears, as it were, so that we might have the joy of salvation. Now, if you want to become a lawyer or a doctor or a scientist or a professor, you have to spend years of study. You, sto you sow study and you reap professionally. There was a hillbilly from the South who felt lost at Times Square, New York. So he asked a young fellow with a long beard, how, is the, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And snapping his fingers, the bearded man replied, practice man, practice. <laughs> and to be a great musician like Pavarotti, you have to practice passionately and perpetually. You reap excellence if you sow effort, but you have to sow in order to reap. Have you been sowing in good deeds? Have you been sowing in repentance? Have you been sowing in faith? Have you been sowing in Bible reading and prayer and church going faithfully? Have you been sowing so you can reap the grace and the mercy of God? Or have you been sowing the wild oats that so many people sow? Or been sowing things for your own lust and your own pleasures? And you're going to reap someday that which you have sowed. And then the second thing, if you sow, you will reap. Every person is a sower and a reaper. Now, the Bible teaches that Satan is a deceiver. And in Galatians 6, it says, be not deceived. Many of you are already deceived. He that soweth to his flesh, that is, lust, drugs, wrong kinds of sex, too much drink, shall of the flesh reap corruption. In Proverbs 6, it says, A wicked man soweth discord, therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. The Bible warns that if we continue that kind of life, we will be broken. We'll, we're going to reap what we sow. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in his The Reaper and the Flowers says, Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. You remember Cain became jealous of his brother Abel, and he killed his brother in a fit of jealousy and rage and became the first murderer, and that was the first war, and that took place in paradise. Many people say, oh, if we only change society, if we make the world better, if we spend more money, if everybody had everything they wanted, it would, they would, we would produce a new man. This is what uh, Marx taught. This is what Lenin strongly believed. He had great ideals. He believed that they would ultimately produce a new man. But we've lived long enough now to know that it has not produced a new man. The only person that can produce a new man is the one that said, you must be born again. It doesn't mean really born again. It means born from above, born by the Spirit of God. Just as you were born into the physical world and from your mother's womb, you must be born into the spiritual world. And so in one sense, it's being born the second time. The third thing is you will reap what you sow. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In Numbers 32, it says, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin, and we're all sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and sin means the breaking of God's law, the breaking of the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says if you break those commandments in one place, you're guilty of all. And we're all sinners, and we've broken all the commandments. We all need the mercy and the grace and the love of God. Be sure your sin will find you out. Every sin that has ever been committed is going to be found out either in this life or at the judgment. Somewhere, sometime, every little sin that you've committed and every big sin will find you out. Because you remember the tapes 
back in Watergate days and what they did to a president? God has tapes far more sophisticated. Not only does he record all of our actions, but all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our intents are recorded. And you may deny it at the judgment and say, God, it just didn't happen that way. He's got it all there. He has every moral choice you faced and he has the road that you took. You'll reap what you sow. In Job 4, it says, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. You're going to reap. Everything that you sow, you'll reap. I read in Time Magazine review of a book entitled Wild Oats. And some people live by the philosophy that you sow your wild oats all week, then go to church on Sunday morning and pray for crop failure. It's not going to be that way. The crop is going to come in. And how many of us go to church and we really don't know Christ? I did. I was reared a Presbyterian. And I was baptized. I was confirmed in the church. And I thought everything was all right. I thought the minister was a little bit boring. I didn't particularly like going to church, but I went because my parents told me to go. And if you knew my father, you know you'd go if he told you. But I really didn't have Christ in my heart. I didn't have assurance. I didn't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I wasn't sure of that. I wasn't certain that my sins had been forgiven. So one day when they had an evangelistic meeting, I went forward and received Christ into my heart and recommitted my life to Christ. And I remember the things that I promised those elders when I met with them at the time of confirmation. And I said, Lord, I'm going to recommit my life to you. I'm going to surrender to you. I'm not sure where I stand, but I want to be sure. And that simple decision changed my entire life. But life doesn't always work that way. In Proverbs 28, it says, He that covered his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. God is willing to have mercy upon you. He's willing to bestow his grace upon you. He's willing to forgive you if you willing to repent of your sin and receive him. You see, the Bible says that sin is no respect of persons. In James 1, it says, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And that death is not only natural death when your body dies, but you can be dead right now where you're sitting, spiritually dead. You're dead toward God. That's the reason people can't find peace and joy and happiness today. They search for it. They want it, but they can't find it. You can't find it in drugs. You can't find it in an extramarital affair. You can't find it any other place. Oh, you can have a temporary time. You can get drunk and go out with some girl and have a good time for a while, but it soon wears off. It's gone. I had a bishop. We've had a number of bishops, but one bishop in particular who came forward in our meeting. An Anglican bishop in England. And later, I saw him privately. And I said, Bishop, why did you have to come forward? He said, you know, I've been to the university, I've gotten my degrees, and I've been to the theological school and all the rest. And he said, I'm, I'm now in my 50s and I'm a bishop. But he said, I am not sure where I stand before God. And I just wanted to make sure. Do you feel that way? You can make sure tonight before you leave here. And then the fourth thing, the ignorance of what you are sowing won't keep you from reaping. Leviticus 19, 19 says, Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. The Bible teaches that when the good seed of the Word of God is sown, the devil comes along and sows tares. Jesus said, you can sow or allow to be sowed in your life to the devil and you'll reap hell. The devil for thousands of years has been issuing an invitation to hell to all of those who sow to the sins of the flesh, to those who permit Satan to sow tares in their lives. Come to Christ now. Give him your life. On the cross, Jesus Christ conquered Satan and hell and sin. And in 1 John 3, 8, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, 
For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil so that we might live the life after Christ. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ comes to live within you and gives you a new power to live a life that you never dreamed you could live. And he produces within you love and joy and peace and satisfaction and fulfillment that you never knew before. And he puts you on the right road because Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road that leads to life everlasting. And then fifthly and lastly, you will reap more than you sow. Hosea 8, 7 says, They have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. John 4, 36 says, He receiveth wages that reaps. Charles Reed wrote a century ago, Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Lord Macaulay, the great historian, once wrote, Old men reap. Someone was showing a clergyman through one of the prisons the other day in the east. And they saw an old man sitting there weeping. And they asked the warden, what is he doing? And the warden replied, he's reaping. And that's where many of us are going. We're going to a place where we're going to reap. We've been sowing all these weeks and months and years, and we think we're getting by with it. Our conscience no longer bothers us. Why? Because the Bible teaches that you can harden your conscience. You can cause it to become dead. It no longer speaks. It's no longer an accurate guide for you. Come to Christ and he'll resensitize your conscience. A hundred million people die every year. 270 million die every day. 10,000 people die every hour. 180 die every minute. Three die every second. And you will be one of those statistics one of these days. Are you ready to meet God? The Bible says prepare to meet God. Jesus said, the dead shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Two crowds. You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do to make sure, to make certain? Many people want to be sure, but they don't know what to do. First, you must repent of sin. The word repent means to turn, to change. To change the direction of your life, to change your mind. You change your mind about God, you change your mind about yourself and your need of God. And you go home ready to change the way you treat your wife or your husband or your parents or your children or your neighbors or the people you work with. You're ready for a change. Second, you put your total confidence and your total faith in Christ alone. You're not depending on anything else for your future salvation except the cross and the resurrection of Christ. For by the grace of God are you saved. The word grace means unmerited favor, something I don't deserve. Billy Graham doesn't deserve to go to heaven. I deserve to go to the judgment. I deserve hell. But I'm going to heaven by the grace of God by Christ who died on the cross and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible moment, something happened that none of us really understands. God laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus became the great sin bearer. He died for us. Then he comes into our hearts and he gives us a power to do good works. And we go out with a burden for our neighbors, a burden for peace in the world, for a burden to help the hungry, to feed the poor, to help the poor. That's our responsibility as believers. But we don't have the power to do the things we ought to do or to live the life we ought to do. But Jesus Christ gives it to you. He rose again. And we reap eternal life, forgiveness, peace, joy, love. The power of the Holy Spirit comes within eternity in heaven. We sang the song a moment ago, Amazing Grace. Do you know the story of that song? It was written by a slaver, a man by the name of John Newton. And John Newton became the slave of a slave in West Africa. 
And one day, when he was coming back to England on the slave ship and treating the slaves miserable and terrible, they had a thunderstorm. And he fell on his face and he remembered some scriptures that his mother had taught him when he was a boy. And he received Christ into his heart and it changed his life. And he went back to England and became a great friend of those who were to someday lead the fight against slavery in Parliament and did more to help probably than any other person motivate the British people toward outlawing slavery. He himself became the minister of an Anglican church. He himself wrote many hymns. And that was one of the hymns he wrote, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. I don't deserve it. John Newton said, I don't deserve it. And when he was an old man and he could barely get up into the pulpit and he was in his middle 80s, he held on to the pulpit and he said, I don't know much. But he said, I do know this, that I'm a great sinner and I have a great Savior. And John Newton left his mark for God after being a terrible sinner. You can be forgiven of any sin, any failure. It may be hypocrisy, whatever it is, but tonight you'd like to make sure. I'm going to ask you to do something that I've asked Africans for the thousands to do, Asians for the thousands, Europeans for the thousands, Americans for the thousands, and I've seen them do it for the thousands. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat where you're sitting right now and come and stand in front on this beautiful turf and stand there for a moment or two quietly and say, you know, I want to be sure about this. I want to be sure my sins are forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want this supernatural peace and joy and fulfillment that Christ can give me. And I want to settle it. I would like to rededicate myself to my confirmation vows or to my ba what my baptism meant. Whatever the reason, whatever your need, I'm going to ask you to get up and come and stand. And after you've all come and stood there, I'm going to have a prayer with you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. Or you may be the only one from your area to come, but get up and come. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium now at this holy moment. And everyone in an attitude of prayer, you get up and come. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. I don't know who you are, but you need Christ. You come right now. We're going to wait on you. Just come and stand here quietly, young and old, whatever, whoever you are. We're going to wait, Catholic or Protestant, Jewish, whatever. You come and stand here and say yes and make sure of your relationship to Christ. And you may be in the choir or you may just be somebody that wandered in, but God is speaking to you. You come. Just stand here in front behind those cameras that or around here, or right in here. We're going to wait on you, quickly. Bring somebody with you. And as these many hundreds make their personal decision for Christ here in Fargo, North Dakota, you too, wherever you are, can make that decision. Call the number on your television screen right now. If the line is busy, wait a few moments and call again.
I want to say a word to you that have been watching on television. You've been watching from other parts of the country and other parts of other countries. And you see people coming here in Fargo, Moorhead City, Fargo, North Dakota, Moorhead City, Minnesota, and other parts of this great Midwestern area, or Northern Plains area, whatever area we want to call it. And you see them coming to make their commitment. You can make your commitment where you are, in your hotel room, or in your bedroom, or in your living room, or with your family. Make your surrender to Christ now and say, Lord, I need you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Give me assurance of my own faith. I'm going to pray that you'll make that commitment now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, a wonderful story in the life of Jesus Christ. And just one verse of Scripture, and it's a very brief verse. It says, and he must needs go through Samaria. Jesus had been teaching. The scribes and the Pharisees had been listening. They had told him that John the Baptist had just been imprisoned and he taught as one having authority. And the people came to listen and he taught in great simplicity so that the common people heard him gladly. And now he has to go back to Galilee. He's down south in Judea. Now he's going to go to Galilee. He doesn't get on a plane. He doesn't get on a bus. He doesn't get in a car. He walks. And while it wasn't a very long distance by today's standards, in those days, that was a long distance to go from Judea up to Galilee. And he was going to Cana. But it says he must needs go through Samaria because, you see, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. They didn't like each other. They avoided each other. The Samaritans had intermarried. They were not pure-blooded. And then they had the Jewish people would always go on the eastern side or they'd go the western side of the Jordan River to avoid going through Samaria. But Jesus, it says, must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because Jesus had an appointment there that he was going to keep. That appointment had been made centuries earlier in the council halls of God that he must needs go through Samaria. You know, much of the Bible lands is desert. Water is extremely important. Wells are important. And in Samaria, at the foot of two mountains, was Jacob's well that Jacob had dug. There's not only water that you drink for your physical needs, but there's spiritual water. Jesus said, I am the water of life. 
Jeremiah said, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In a number of places, the Bible refers to people who have no spiritual water. Ye shall be as the garden that hath no water, says Isaiah, the first chapter. In Zechariah, it says, prisoners of the pit wherein there's no water. 2 Peter 2, 17, these are wells with no water, spiritual water. The Scripture says in Isaiah, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. It says that the waters are like our own hearts. Our hearts are troubled and they never rest. I watch the waters, they never seem to rest. They're always moving and disturbed. And God says there's no peace to those who reject God. There's no peace to those who are not living for God. Now the scarcity of spiritual water throughout the world today is tremendous. People are hungry and thirsty. We read about it in our papers constantly. And people in this country are going to the wrong watering holes, searching for satisfaction, searching for something that only the water of life and the bread of life could meet. And that person is Jesus Christ, who is the water of life and the bread of life. You can go down our streets in the major cities of America and see our young people searching for something. They don't know what. Like that girl at Harvard University. She cried for several days and finally the psychiatrist said, I can do nothing with her. And so they called for the family to come and the father and mother came. And she finally blurted out to her father, Father, I want something, but I don't know what it is. And many people are like that. They're searching for something and they go to all kinds of things, whether it's drink or sex or whatever it is, to try to find that answer. Maybe it's money or maybe it's power, whatever it is. But it doesn't really satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. Searching for something that will bring satisfaction and quench this terrible spiritual thirst that only God can satisfy. Water in the Middle East is very scarce and often hard to obtain. A man who owns a well of water is sometimes better off than if he owned a well of oil. Many wars have been fought over water. In our text today, Jesus has been teaching in Judea. He's going through Samaria. It's the shortest way, but it's not the way that the Jewish people of that day went because they had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus knew about the woman that he was going to see. He knew that he had an appointment with that woman. He wanted to teach his disciples a lesson in race relations or a lesson in how to win people to Christ. Jesus was weary. He sits down at Jacob's well. The disciples had gone to town to buy food. This woman came. It was almost noon. Women usually came in the evening when it was cooler. But this woman came alone in the middle of the day when it was very hot. But because of her character, she was probably a social outcast. She came with her water pot to get water. And Jesus asked her for a drink. That absolutely shook her because Samaritans and Jews didn't even talk to each other. And certainly no Jewish person would ask a Samaritan for a favor. In just that moment, Jesus was sweeping away many prejudices that people have, like race prejudice. One of the greatest needs we have in America is for the Lord to come into our hearts and take away our prejudice against other people who don't look like we do 
and who don't have the same color of skin that we have. It takes full-time prayer and saying, oh God, take this from my heart. And then there was national prejudice because of the Jews and the Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. We have today a crisis in nationalism in many parts of the world. It's rising. That's the reason many people are concerned about the situation in the world, because there are many dangerous areas in the world. And I was always thankful for the work that people like James Becker did to help bring peace to the world. But Jesus saw this woman sitting there on Jacob's well, and he said, would you give me a drink? And she was astonished at such tolerance and courtesy and kindness that she saw in his eyes. And she said, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink which I'm a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with us Samaritans? He didn't want to force religion on her. He begins on another subject entirely. He's tactful. He's diplomatic. He asks for a favor. He puts himself under obligation to the woman. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given the living water. God offers all of us a gift tonight. It's something you can't work for. It's something you can't buy. It's something you can't earn. It's a gift. It's free. It's spiritual water. It's forgiveness of all your sins because of the cross and the resurrection. Isaiah the prophet said in the 55th chapter, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and you that have no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? The prophet asked. And you labor for that which satisfies not. The thing that you work so hard for and the thing that you desire so much and the thing that you go out to enjoy doesn't satisfy. This woman replied, she said, Sir, you don't have anything to draw with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water you're talking about? You see, she mistook the kind of water he was talking about. He was talking about living, eternal water. She went back to the well. She was talking about that water. Now, the Bible teaches that we are blind to the glories and the thrill of the love of God and the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 3.14 it says, but their minds were blinded. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 it says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There's a supernatural power that blinds you, spiritually blind. Physically, you have perfect eyesight, but spiritually, you're blind. You were blinded by an outside spiritual force called the devil. 1 Corinthians 2 says, But the natural man, that's you, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He offers you that water tonight. Is your soul, is your spirit, is your mind thirsty for something more in life that you haven't found? Oh yes, you may be baptized. You might have been confirmed in the church and you're a good person and you go to church. 
But deep inside your heart, something is lacking. There isn't the fulfillment and the satisfaction and the peace that you would like to have and that you believe God could give you. What should you do? Drink of the living water. Jesus provides the living water at the cross. He went to the cross. As Mrs. Baker so beautifully told us a moment ago, and there he was beaten and reviled. That wasn't his real suffering. His real suffering came when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible, awful, mysterious moment, God had laid on him the sins of the world. Your sins and my sins, everything I've ever done wrong was put on Jesus. He took the judgment and the hell that I deserve on that cross. Jesus was offering this woman water for her thirsty soul. Our souls are empty and lonely and guilty. She felt the emptiness of her own soul and she said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. She was very sincere, but sincerity alone is not enough. A few years ago in the Rose Bowl, a man picked up the football Everybody shouted. They were all to their feet because the score was tied, and he ran for a touchdown. But he'd gone the wrong way, and he scored for the other side. He was very sincere. You never saw a more sincere man as you watched him, but he was wrong. You can be sincere in your religion, but you can be wrong. There is a way, the Bible says, that seems right, but the end thereof is the way of judgment and death. You may be on the wrong road. God is asking you tonight to turn around toward the cross by faith. Repent of your sins and receive Him as your Lord and Master and make sure of it. There are hundreds of you here tonight that have religion, but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ. And you'd like to make sure before you leave here. You'd like to know that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. But you're not sure of it. You don't have that peace and that joy that you believe is there somewhere for you and you haven't found it. Come and take of this living water, which is Christ tonight. Now, the kingdom of God is not entered easily. Jesus said you have to go through a narrow gate and walk a narrow road and you may be misunderstood and even persecuted, and you may suffer for your faith. So Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Now, he was hitting on a sore nerve. What a spot he touched in her life. He knew her sins. He knows yours. What an overwhelming flood of guilt and remorse this brought to her. She shrank back. It was as if a thousand searchlights had been turned on in her heart and every dirty secret in her life leaped into the glare. No person can come to Christ until there's conviction that you have sinned against God and you have repented. And repentance means to change your mind, change your direction, change your way of living. It means that you're willing to change. She partly covered it up and said, I have no husband. The scripture says, he that covered this sin shall not prosper. Jesus gently reminded her that technically she was right. She had no husband. She had had five husbands and the man she was now living with was not her husband. And she said two things. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And please, sir, would you give me this living water? I want it. I need it. I need it in my life. At that moment, she acted on the light that she had, which wasn't much. You don't have to know much when you come to Christ. You don't have to know the whole gospel. You don't have to know the Bible. 
You just come like you are. The thief on the cross didn't know very much, but he turned to Jesus while he was dying and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Just remember me. He had no time to join a church. He had no time to be baptized. He had no time for anything. He just said, Lord, remember me, and that's all that was needed because Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You and I are to worship God in spirit and in truth. Where you worship God is not the important thing. It's how you worship God. You worship him in prayer, in the reading of the Bible, in giving to the church, in going to church. We worship God and we adore him. And everything we do is an act of worship, if you know Christ. In all these ways, we worship God. Jesus made the greatest of all revelations to her when he said, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he's going to explain all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he. I am the Messiah. What a shock that was to her, that she was talking to the Messiah that the Samaritans and the Jews both were looking for and we're looking for today. At that moment, she was converted. At that moment, her name was written in the book of life. At that moment, she guaranteed, she was guaranteed a place in the kingdom of heaven. And from that moment on, she became a witness. She proved that she, was, had, that she had met Christ. She left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, she didn't say it to the ladies because they probably had nothing to do with her. The men knew her. So she said it to the men, come and see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ that we've been waiting for? And many Samaritans in that city believed. Here was the, a woman evangelist evangelizing among men, telling them about Jesus. She didn't have much theology to tell them. She didn't know what to say. All she said was, come and see Jesus, and Jesus will change your life as he's changed mine. Have you been to Jesus that way? Have you come? Are you sure your sins are forgiven? Have you been to the cross and said, Lord, I have sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of life. And I come by faith. I don't understand it all, but by faith I receive you as my Lord and my Master and my Savior. We've seen hundreds of people each of these two nights that we've been here come. And I ask people to come and stand in front of the platform. And as they come, you're coming and saying, Lord, I'm coming to you. I want to make sure of my relationship with you. I want this living water. I want this living water in my own life and in my home. I want this living water in my work. I want this living water at all times. I'm thirsty. I need God. I need to make sure. I need to make certain. We never know when our moment is going to come when we have to face God. I'm going to ask you to get up and come tonight and make sure of your relationship with Christ. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'm going to have a prayer with you, say a word to you, and give you some literature that you can take back to your home and study and read, and it'll help you to grow. All over the stadium, from that top stadium up there, we've timed it. It takes about five or six minutes for you to come. Don't let distance keep you from Christ because you may never have a moment like this again. When will you ever have a moment in Pittsburgh like this again when you can come and make a commitment like this? Jesus said, if you are not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and settling it and sealing it in your life. We're going to, uh, Jesus died on the cross publicly for you. 
Now you can come publicly and say yes to him. You may be sitting down here. You may be up there. You may be up here in that middle section. Wherever you are, God is speaking to you. There's a little voice that says you ought to come to Christ. We're going to wait on you as you come right now to this living water.